Hello, welcome back to another episode of Extractions and Ire, and this one is all about the element strontium. Well, we're not going to try and get to strontium metal, we're trying just to get to strontium carbonate, but we are going to be extracting it from its main ore using the industrial process mostly. We're going to use a microwave, the industrial process doesn't use a microwave. I think I can say that with some confidence. Getting a little ahead of myself, let's talk about strontium. What's what's the deal with strontium? Strontium is not an obscure element. I'm sure most people watching this video would have heard of strontium. And I'm sure you're like, strontium? Oh, that's used in fireworks. <sighs> yes, it's used in fireworks, but I can't imagine that much actual tons of strontium salts actually get used in fireworks. Maybe it does. I think the reason why everyone always says, oh, strontium is used in fireworks is because it's not really used elsewhere. <laughs> There's just not that many uses of strontium. There used to be, there used to be a, a really big use of strontium in which was the old CRT TVs used strontium in the glass to absorb all the x-rays so that you didn't get irradiated when you're watching the TV. Because we don't use CRT uh, TVs anymore, that use of strontium has completely phased out. But there is a lot of strontium out there, which is why it's the weird, well not weird, but why it's kind of, I guess, a little sad that it doesn't have that many uses. If you look at the crustal abundances you know there's a wikipedia that's got this table in it it ranks strontium as 15th which is pretty high and i reckon you could make a compelling argument for strontium being the most available useless element no maybe not useless useless is a little hard uh, abundance versus its use case strontium will probably be the rank the lowest out of all the elements it might get some competition from elements like lanthanum and scandium which are quite common still and have potentially even less uses than strontium. Maybe they rank lower. Anyway, I'm not trying to be a strontium hater here. Onto its ore. So it is mined from strontonite, which makes sense. Strontium mined from strontonite. But also its main ore is celestite or celestine. I'm sure there's one that's correct, but people use it pretty much 50-50. And I'm fairly sure in this video, I'm going to forget which one is the correct one, correct one, and which one is the other one. So sometimes I'm going to call it celestite, sometimes I'm going to call it celestine. The samples we're going to get are really, really nice. <laughs> I'm sure most celestite that's mined does not look this nice, but you can get some really, really nice samples. These came from Madagascar, but of course strontium sulfate, very, very insoluble. That's why it makes these nice minerals here. We really want strontium carbonate. So how do we go from strontium sulfate to strontium carbonate? Well, industrially, and the method that we're gonna use as well is to reduce the sulfate to the sulfide because that makes it then water soluble. It reacts with water to produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, and you get strontium hydroxide uh, or whatever and then you can react that further. How do we get the sulfate to the sulfide? Well, we need to heat it with carbon. It needs to get pretty hot. Uh, so it needs to get to over 800 degrees, 1000 degrees probably is, is a good range for the reaction. And that's too hot for most of the stuff that I own, right? My hot plate can pretty easily get to 300 and it's pushing 350 degrees. The the burner, like a gas burner, um, will get to 600, maybe pushing 650, but it's not going to get a lot hotter than that. We're kind of in the range of uh, like burners, like acetylene burners and that sort of thing. Like it's getting pretty hot. But I found a paper that did it in a microwave. And, and the advantage of doing it in the microwave is it gets very hot very quickly because it's got carbon in it, it's a lot of carbon, the carbon absorbs the microwaves, heats up very hot, very quickly. Will this set a microwave on fire if it gets to a thousand degrees? I don't know, what sort of crucible can we use that's going to survive getting heated to a thousand degrees? I don't know. So there's a lot to find out about here. <laughs> I, have, I, have it, I have two microwaves. We've got one spare microwave as collateral. Uh, yeah. After we've got the sulfide, we're going to react it and get the hydroxide and whatever, and then we can selectively precipitate out the strontium by adding a carbonate ion or carbon dioxide. I want a nice red flame at the end from the strontium. I want to see that nice flame color. So yeah, so we're starting from the mineral and we're just going to be using carbon microwaves, carbon dioxide and water. You can tell it's an industrial process because none of the reagents in here 
are expensive at all. Air, earth, fire, water, you know, as our reactants. So yeah, let's destroy this thing of beauty. Why not? So I've got these two celestite samples here and I was gonna crush both of them, but this sample is quite nice. So this sample is 280 grams and it looks like it's got quite a bit of matrix on it in that 280 grams. It's hard to tell where the, uh, the strontium sulfate ends in this sort of clay matrix, not clay. I don't know enough geology. People are gonna call me out if I get the geology wrong in this video, but we won't smash this one. We'll, we'll pass on it and um, we'll smash this one. This sample is a lot heavier. It's 480 grams and it looks like there's a lot less matrix in that too. Probably have to find a really big hammer. I also gotta find my ball mill. I, I, I have a ball mill. I, I bought it pretty sure like years ago. Gotta find where I put it and wonder if I cleaned it. What are the chances I actually cleaned all the, what do they call it, media? The steel shot in it before I put it away. Okay, I found it. It's a little rusty, which sucks. But no, I absolutely didn't clean this steel shot. It's covered in bismuth powder still. I used to crush all that bismuth up. I mean, it's not horrendous. There's no like big lumps of bismuth in it, I think. But the balls are not clean. <laughs> I don't have black powder on it. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. Actually, I'm going to go put a face shield on this. All right, let's go. Oh, hell yeah. Look at these chunks. All right, I've separated off some bits that are just definitely mostly matrix there's obviously still quite a bit of matrix left in this but we've got a lot of chemical purification steps coming up so i'm not too worried about it it's just dead weight you know that we carry through um but yeah some of this stuff is astonishingly nice i guess it it, it you know cleaves along the crystal face while i'm marveling at its beauty i am just going to keep hitting it with a hammer break it up some more before it's ready for the ball meal so just appreciating its beauty one last time before i uh, start to really grind it up into a <laughs> fine powder because stuff like this is going to um, work really well in the ball mill. So we're going to be running the um, reduction with carbon. For stoichiometry, we need about 100 grams of carbon. 100 grams of carbon is, is quite a bit, but also the paper uh, goes into a bit more depth, uses either 50% excess or 100% excess, um, which isn't really needed for the reaction, but that extra carbon absorbs all the microwaves uh, a lot better, so the reaction gets hotter faster. So we'll be using excess, so we want about 150 grams of carbon. Now, I swear I had a huge bucket of activated carbon somewhere that I picked up probably close to a decade ago and I don't think I've ever used. And that would have been perfect for this reaction, but um, I can't find it. So uh, we're back to getting carbon the old fashioned way, which is, um finding ancient burn sites. And by ancient, I mean like, you know, <laughs> like my family burning shit on the property. It's free carbon. There's some reagent lying on the ground. I don't know if this is really going to be a great idea, but you know, you can't say no to, to free reagent like this. The only catch here is that I might just get bitten by a snake, but you know, you run that risk every day of your life, so whatever. This is good stuff. I'm a big fan of this uh, um, burn site because it <laughs> appears that a mattress has just been set on fire here. So I'm sure that's certainly a thing that looks like a speaker cone. Good carbon here, look at this. Quality reagent, you know? Can't say no to that. Is it mattress carbon? Is that what, it's, is that what this is? 
Is that, does, do, do mattresses make good carbon? Reply in the comments. This is definitely snake domain. You know, I feel like I'm being watched. You gonna kill me? No, okay. Let's leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Over charcoal. A little bit of ash on it. That's fine. Might put a little bit more in. I'll give it a wash. Sure. I could just use it as is, like crush it and just use it as is. I'm sure it'll be fine, but got a bit of ash on there, so I'll just give it a quick rinse before using it. Put in a bit of extra mass. So if we lose a lot of ions uh, with a water wash, still be close to 150 grams. That's cool. All right, does this incredibly grimy old blender work? Okay, promising sounds, but the blades do not spin. Why do I still have this? I bet some of you in the comments will recognize this blender from like genuinely five years ago. Does the ice really need to be crushed? Well, seeing as everything's already freezing cold, probably not, but truth is, I like using the blender, so we're gonna use the blender. Yeah, do what I want. I gotta throw more things in the bin. If it doesn't work, it goes in the bin, whatever. Thank you for your service. <laughs> cool. That was violent. Stupid bloody blender being broken. Gotta bloody grind this up by hand. Buddy. Goddamn grinding. I genuinely forget how fun this is, I'll be honest. Hell yeah. We've got a lot going on here, but um, we've got our, our um, carbon, which is mostly dry. Still a bit more wet than I wanted it to, so each one of these is 75 grams. And we've got a bit of spare carbon in here as well. We've got quite a bit of reasonably well-powered samples. We've got 100 grams in here, and we've got 85 grams in here. Now I'm looking at this sort of scale. I'm realizing the volumes are quite large, and we have to heat this in the microwave, and I don't know how we're going to heat. <laughs> stuff so well and to keep this project moving rather than uh, keep this going um, to get all this celestine into a finer powder I might just separate off the steel ball bearings here and run with the 185 grams of powder sample we have here what I want to do is I want to mix that with the carbon now and put all of that in the ball mill because we need to it's 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 fine but it's not that fine it could be finer I'm getting covered in it I should be wearing gloves but insoluble minerals so I feel like I let my guard down a little here but uh, to do the stoichiometry it's a little bit tiny bit wet still so I'll, I'll put a bit of an excess in so done the maths 75 grams of carbon with 185 grams of um, celestite should give us quite an excess of carbon so we can heat in the microwave um, efficiently and, and it should get hot very quickly we'll collect all these these ball bearings off and then put this and all these in the bowl mill for quite an extended amount of time so that everything gets nicely ground up together and nicely well mixed so we should be able to take it directly out of the ball mill take the ball bearings out and then put it into the microwave It's had overnight in the tumbler, so it's had quite a few hours now, so we... What? Oh, it... <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, has a crusted overlayer at the top there. Alright. How is it? Not as good as I thought it was going to be. Go 
God damn. It's all caked in there. Okay, this stuff is nowhere near as powdery as I, as I thought it would be. And I think it's because of residual moisture left in the carbon. Obviously, carbon will absorb a lot of moisture because it's quite porous. And, and I knew that, but I didn't think it would be such a problem. But it's weird. Kind of compress it together and, and form a little, little pellet. Just a little bit wet sand. That's its kind of texture. Which is surprising because the, the charcoal was, was pretty dry when it went in. At least I thought so. I was a little dumbfounded how uh, we basically took carbon powder like this, quite fine powder, the Celestine powder, which was quite fine, and it looks like this, and we ended up making something that isn't fine. <laughs> but if we grab like one of these little mouse turd looking things, we can see that it's, it's not just one crystal or one lump of carbon. It's, you know, they f it falls apart. It falls apart, it crumbles into a powder. What's happened is because there's a little bit of residual moisture, it's just clumped stuff together with the carbon. I'll dry this out now. We need it to be dry before it goes into the microwave because if there's any water and we do create some sulfide, it'll generate hydrogen sulfide in the microwave, it's flammable gas. That's not ideal. We do really need to pre-dry it now anyway. So uh, I will heat this again up pretty hot and nowhere near the temperature it needs for the actual conversion, but hopefully we'll dry out all this water and maybe all these little pebbles will fall apart. Maybe this is a thing that happens all the time with the milling and it has a technical term or a, you know, a non-technical term that everyone knows except me, but you know, trying new things, and I wasn't expecting it. Stupid goddamn ball mill making me use the mortar and pestle anyway. Nah, this is fine. It's good. It's good. My time use has been valid. I am not wasting my life. All right, now that's what I'm talking about. There's still a few larger chunks, but it's mostly a really nice mix of the carbon and the celestite. So that's exactly what I wanted. And it's all dry now, you know, you see it doesn't clump together at all. I can't make a little ball of it or anything like that. So this is perfect. It took a while to get here, but this I think has really good potential. All right, so we have our nice fine powder. We have a microwave, a lab microwave that is not in great condition, but I'm pretty sure still produces microwaves. What are we putting the powder in to put it in the microwave? And look, the paper we're following uses some ceramic crucible, uh, and I could go online and get some fancy, you know, magnesium oxide crucible, but I thought maybe it will just work with like normal porcelain, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just from Kmart. <laughs> I've got a couple of these. These are like $1.50. So if they shatter, it's fine. As long as the powder stays vaguely inside them. So like a mug to kind of cover it with. Right? <laughs> what do we think? In previous years, I would have just got this from the kitchen cupboard and destroyed a mug that I would have actually used. But now I'm a... I'm an independent person, you know, I went out and spent $3 on, on a new mug and whatever this is, an ex espresso cup? Espresso. Espresso. Microwave safe. All right, well, we'll be testing that to the limit. Four hundred, four hundred thirty degrees. So yes, yeah, some yellowing of the paint with a glaze on the, on the, you know, high quality ceramic here. What? What's that? It's gone first. Oh yeah. Ugh. Broke it. 
it pushing 500 degrees. Oh, rest in peace. Sad. All right, attempt two, it's in a new espresso cup. Um, but we're gonna pause at two minutes just to let it think about it. I don't know, I don't know what else to do. It's, it's probably not gonna work. Good luck. Back up to 400 degrees. All right, give me a couple of minutes. Hi, all right, hi. So this has the maximum of 520 degrees. I don't think I've ever hit that before, but it still looks exactly the same. attempt will it last in the mug there's not very much of it in there but let's see it's the only bits of pottery that aren't broken at the moment this close yeah look you can start to see looks different now Had a good run we got over 20 minutes i reckon of microwaving things got very hot and then eventually we shattered the glass of the uh the base plate the turny thing so that's a bit of a shame i think it, i think it's worked at least somewhat i don't know it looks it looks promising but yeah it's it's was a it's, it's a tough ass to get it as hot as, as as we need it to so it's definitely got that white coloration on the top there maybe like it's been ashed but it's not really been fused together, which is not a great sign. I think it's still quite powdery. Oh, oh, it's a different color quite all the way through, all right. Maybe we are onto something. All right, I have some lead nitrate test paper, which will go black in the presence of hydrogen sulfide, just to, just as a test. Uh, there's not much hydrogen sulfide generation just in water, but uh, if I add some nitric acid, it does actually start to bubble. Look, it's not a lot, but it is pretty stinky. There we go. It's actually working. It's actually working. All right, spurred on by the success of the first batch, we still have 150 grams worth of carbon and uh, celestite mix. It's in here. It's just gonna go in here, slowly. Yeah. And then uh, I'll assemble some other stuff around it. All right, so the small cup, which might shatter, is in the larger cup and sort of held from touching that smaller cup by some brick. The thought being that even if um, the terracotta breaks, it might get held in place by this brick. You know, it, it like has cracks, but it still holds its shape. And that's what worked well last time. Not that we had anything holding shape, but it did crack. It just held its shape enough to hold the material in there. Might be a little better. <laughs> well, instead of a plate, I've got a fire brick in there, which spins. So I don't know why I didn't do that the first time. In my mind, I had a, a design that was like made out of fire brick and I like made a little holder for this to slid in with like the fire brick on all sides. As per always, this, this, what this channel lacks is really execution. <laughs> can go into there we'll chuck a lid on it too just to keep the heat in I'm sure that plate will shatter but that's all right feeling confident I'm feeling more confident than last time i don't know let's chuck it in for a couple minutes all right it's been in there for about 15 minutes it doesn't look like anything's catastrophically cracked everything is very hot but um yeah All right, well, I'll keep it going. I think it's going well, it just needs more time. All right, it's uh, had oh, quite a lot in the microwave, maybe over 
an extra 20 minutes and maybe 35 minutes microwave time across about a 45 minute period. I don't need to say it's hot. It's obviously very hot. Everything's kind of cracked, but at least it's all held in place now with these uh, bricks it's cracked all in there. But hopefully we've converted uh, a considerable amount of it. Again, microwave has been once again pushed to its limit. That is scorching, but uh, yeah, I'm optimistic. And here is our strontium solution. Uh, we filtered off all the unreacted carbon, all the unreacted celestite and whatever other insoluble things in there. It had like a week to react and, and it's still a little acidic. So we assume that all the sulfide that could have reacted has now reacted and the strontium should be in solution as strontium nitrate. It has gone a little yellow, but not too bad. So I think it should be okay. And so now how do we get our strontium ions out of solution? Well, we can precipitate it out as a carbonate because strontium carbonate is uh, virtually insoluble. And this is what's done industrially. And uh, we could do um, one of the most common industrial methods uh, and add sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate, we've got like a whole kilo here. It's very cheap. And if we dump that in there, the sodium carbonate is soluble uh, and it'll precipitate out the strontium carbonate. We're not gonna do that because what we really want is some nice pure strontium carbonate at the end and pure enough to have a good flame test. And if we start adding sodium ions into the solution, even though the sodium is soluble, it's gonna get carried over with the strontium. It's gonna ruin our flame color because any sodium ions in there are going to give it an orange flame color um, that's really, really strong and really pervasive. Pervasive, that's the word, yeah. Theoretically, we could get it pure enough. The solubility difference between the strontium and the sodium carbonate is so large, uh, but practically, I, I don't believe it will work that well. So instead, we're going to use the other industrial method of precipitating out a carbonate, which is adding carbon dioxide. And that's what this glassware is for. I went way over the top here, but I haven't built a fancy glassware setup in ages, and I have all this glassware, and I just, haven't done anything <laughs> in ages. So anyway, we, we've got an air pump over here. All right, so air inlet comes in here, goes down here, air goes in here. There's sodium carbonate in here. There's some acid in here. I think it's just some waste sulfuric acid I've had uh, lying around. So th that'll go in there to generate carbon dioxide. The air and the carbon dioxide that's generated will get pushed through, through this quite long hose and goes into here. It gets washed through this water. I mean, do I really need this? bottle here no but once again i'm building a setup and it's cool and i i like having a flask to separate uh disgusting sodium ions from our beautiful and precious strontium ions so this is just distilled water so then it comes through this pipe and it comes out here this bubbler here so we can uh, increase the um reaction between the, the gas and the solution uh it's quite acidic now so um i don't think it will work if we just put carbon dioxide into an acidic solution to get rid of that acidity, I'm going to just use a little bit of ammonium bicarbonate. What we should see as the pH increases, as, as we take away that acidity, um, the strontium hydroxide will probably start precipitating out because that's reasonably insoluble. It's not perfectly insoluble, but it's a little bit insoluble. And then once we see that, we can start pumping through quite a bit of carbon dioxide, which will get absorbed in the uh, strontium hydroxide solution or suspension and precipitate out that insoluble strontium carbonate. How much carbon dioxide do we need? I have no idea, but, but once again, I got a kilo of it for like eight bucks or something like that. So um, I do not care <laughs> how much sodium carbonate I use, as long as filthy sodium ions don't get into our precious solution. That's the important bit.
is our final dry, slightly yellowed powder of strontium carbonate. Thought we got really right to the end before anything turned yellow in it. And it kind of just went a little beigey, so that's fine. Beige, is that the term? Off-white, just slightly off-white. We'll go with that. We put 185 grams of celestite through the microwave with the carbon. If we consider those 185 grams of celestite to be pure strontium sulfate, our yield is about 7%. <laughs> it's just a bit below 7%. It's always a shame not to reach double digits with, with the yield. But there was a couple of bottlenecks, obviously, with, with the yield. First of all, the microwave synthesis is never going to be that effective. We've still got a lot of material. This is the stuff that got filtered out. You know, it's a lot of carbon, but there's just a lot of unreacted celestite in there. Also, I, I did this thing because I, I had like 480 or something grams of rock initially. It, it was so long ago I've started this project. A lot of it... Uh, got crushed up and got quite fine, but there was a lot of crystals left behind and to keep the project moving I just took all the fine stuff the 185 grams of the fine stuff which looked looked kind of more like this Looking back on that I wonder if that was the right move because what we've done is we've selected for all the soft stuff Right because we've collected all the powder everything that was softer would have got crushed into a finer powder quicker And we know there was a bit of matrix in that initial uh, mineral sample, so I guess um, in moving forward with that 185 grams of, of initial powder, that probably had most of the impurities within it. The really nice fine crystalline stuff wouldn't have crushed quite as well. But yes, here we are, here's our final product. So let's run some tests to see if this is actually the thing we think it is and want it to be. All right, so I have some of our strontium carbonate here. It's suspended slightly, it settles out very quickly, but I have a small amount of hydrochloric acid. So what we should see is carbon dioxide bubbles coming off from the carbonate and that really is just confirming that we've got a carbonate and we haven't just precipitated out strontium hydroxide we do indeed have the carbonate so good I was hoping to see some small amount of bubbling oh yeah, that's nice oh it's good see it's, it's not nice. yellow oh it's so uh, slightly yellow now we could just see the red color of the strontium but it's fun to go one step further i've got a fiber coupled spectrometer here. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be heating some strontium carbonate, well suspected strontium carbonate in the flame here. You should see the red coloration on the camera, um, but we should be able to pick up those red peaks through the spectrometer and, and identify them as, as strontium because their the atomic emission lines are quite narrow um, and very characteristic. You'll be able to see that and also see whether we detect any peaks not attributable to strontium. So whether that be calcium or magnesium. Because our chemical process doesn't really uh, filter out the calcium or magnesium very well. If there's calcium or magnesium in the initial rock, it's probably going to be carried through into our final product. So we're just relying on the rock to be low in calcium and magnesium, which I'm not sure will actually be the case. So we'll have to see if we've got any strontium at all and also how contaminated it might be. Alright, and we were able to confirm that we have strontium in our product, so that's that's fantastic. Uh, it took a little while to get those peaks, but um, they did appear. And uh, a couple of other peaks, it looks like we've got a lot of potassium contamination, and I think some calcium as well. But overall, look, <laughs> I'm happy with this. We've got some products, we managed to turn a beautiful mineral into a useful reagent. Uh, that lets us do some strontium chemistry if, if we wanted to. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed um, this probably quite a long video. So yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you for another chemistry video soon. Time to clean up, I guess. It's cleaning time.